Could you introduce yourself and say what it is that you are known for? Um, well, my name is Buzz Dixon, and people tell me I'm the guy who wrote their childhood. And basically that means I was involved in a lot of TV animation in the late 70s through the 80s and uh, early 90s. What is your earliest memory of film and television? Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I've covered that on my blog. I, I went and actually checked release dates of movies because I was curious about this. And apparently, no, no BS aside, apparently the first movie I ever saw was George Millet's From the Earth to the Moon, or Journey Around the Moon, I should say. Voyage to the Moon, excuse me. Voyage to the Moon, that's the name of it. And the reason I know it was the first was because this was the prelude to Around the World in 80 Days. They ran this short, silent French film before they, they ran you know, the main feature. And I remember seeing the short film, and I remember seeing the feature right after it. And I went and I checked the dates, and I couldn't have been more than three and a half years old when I saw this. So this is the first film I can actually remember distinctly and put a date on it. Yes, I saw this at that date. So at age three and a half, George Millet's A Voyage to the Moon. And what kind of hobbies did you have growing up? Well, I was a voracious reader. I, I read just about everything, but I kind of specialized in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I made a lot of models growing up, not just the uh, you know monster models that were available at the time, but I also made like you know tanks and airplanes and ships. I was interested in photography. You know, I shot movies. I had a Super 8 movie camera. And these were all various creative types of things that I did, but those those were the main hobbies. Were you writing when you were in school at that age? Well, I, I tell people I actually wrote my first book before I even knew how to read. Uh, and by that, I mean, when I was a little kid, uh, I was fascinated by dinosaurs. You know, what little kid isn't? And before I had even gone to school, before I had even learned how to read, I had these dinosaur books. And my parents and my grandmother and aunt would read them to me. And I, I drew pictures of the dinosaurs, and I very carefully copied the, the letters underneath them. And then I stapled the whole thing together, and that was my first book. I went around showing everybody I had made a book. I, I would call that my first writing effort. But from a very early age, I was interested in, in storytelling, in writing, in um, uh, you know expressing myself through stories. I did a lot of that. I mean, looking back, I can see that, you know, in in whatever group of kids I was in, I was the joke teller. I was the storyteller. I was the person who, you know, oh, I saw this movie last night. Let me tell you about it. Or I read this story and I, I explain it to them. And so I was always interested in storytelling. That's, I guess it was just hardwired into me from the very beginning. And what was your formal education like? Um, well, well, we moved around a lot as a kid when I was a kid, and basically, I, I until I got into high school, I never went to the same school two years in a row. We either moved to another town or we moved in another neighborhood on the opposite side of the town we were in. But we were we were constantly moving. We used to say we moved once a year just to stay in practice. So I I did fairly well in school. I mean, I got. You know, B's and A's. I got a few C's. Worked really hard to get an F in political science, by the way. I got to I got to comment on that. I, I worked hard to get that F. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I was in high school, we had wound up in uh, a town called Madisonville, Tennessee. And even though we moved four times while living in Madisonville, the the school district was so small, I didn't go to another school. I just kept going to the same school. So freshman through the very beginning of my senior year, I was in Madisonville, which is in Tennessee. And then senior year, uh, we moved to North Carolina. And when I went to the school at North Carolina, they looked at my, my scholastic record and they said, well, you know, in Tennessee, you have to have 20 credits to graduate but you only need 16 to graduate here in North Carolina. And you took an elective course in summer school, or rather, excuse me, you took a uh, required course in summer school so you could take an elective course 
in the fall, and that gives you a total of 16 credits. So, you know, you're, you're qualified already to graduate. And I said, well, great, just hand me a diploma and I'll go home. And they said, no, 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 you, you've actually got to finish the school year. That's the requirement. But, you know, you don't have, there were no mandatory classes to take. So I, I took English, I took every art class, psychology. I mean, I was just cruising through my last year as a, as a senior. And then I got my draft notice because this is 1972. The Vietnam War is still, a, you know, an ongoing thing. I get my draft notice while I'm still in high school. And I thought, this is great. I'll go down to the uh, you know draft board. I'll explain I'm still a high school student. They'll say, oops, our mistake, and they'll forget all about it. So I go down and I explain it to them, and they said, well, we'll be in touch. So a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from them, and they said, well, we checked, and yes, you, uh, you are in high school, so we cannot draft you at this moment. We have to wait until you graduate. And I said, whoa, whoa, but wait, but wait. I said, what if I fail all my courses and I have to repeat a year? And they said, no, nah, we already checked. You've got enough credits to graduate. We got you. <laughs> so 72 hours after I got out of high school, I was uh, I was in the Army. In the Army, I attended what was called Military Journalism School, the Defense Information School at Fort Ben Harrison, uh, Indiana. And from there, I was taught how to be a newspaper editor, uh, a military journalist, uh, got, you know, basic, the basics on, on reporting and editing. I was sent overseas to Korea. I was a camp newspaper editor over there, uh, came back. I was the uh, senior NCOIC for uh, public affairs at the U.S. Army Communications Command in, in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And... After that, I, I uh, when I was discharged, I, I got out in 78. And when I was discharged, um, I had applied to USC's film school and had been accepted. But the film school didn't start until October, and I was discharged in February. So my wife and our uh, older daughter, she's like three at the time, we came out to California. Uh, we figured we'd find a place to live, try to find some work you know, where we can make a little bit of money until school started. So I figured, well, if I want a career in movies, uh, it would be a good idea to get a job at, at some studio somewhere as a driver or in the mailroom or something like that, just to get my feet wet. So I, I literally started at Universal Studios and began working my way down. And I got all the way down to Filmation Studios, which even even I recognized was, you know, like a bottom bottom feeder in the industry at that time. And this is going to carry on into one of your your upcoming questions, but I'll just segue into it now because it, it, it ties in that way. I had gone into Filmation Studios. I had my resume. And what I didn't know was it was in the middle of what they call hiatus season. And hiatus season in animation is that period of time between you finish the last episodes of the shows that were bought for the previous season, the networks haven't started buying shows for the next season, and there's like a two to three month period where there's nothing going on, and, and most studios would reduce down to a skeleton crew at that point. They would keep on the, the staff that they absolutely wanted to keep on, but you know, most of the people they would just send home. I mean, they would furlough them, as they, we would say today. So I'm in there in the middle of uh, hiatus season. I don't know it's hiatus season. And I say, uh, you know, I'd like to submit my resume. I'm looking for a job. And she said, well, do you work in animation or live action? Well, I don't know anything about animation, of course. So I said, well, I guess live action. And she said, well, wait a moment. And she goes in the back. And as I said, I didn't know this was hiatus season. And Arthur Nadell, who was the producer director of their live action shows, he was in the back and he was bored out of his mind. He's just sitting. There's nothing to do. And she comes in, says, there's a guy looking for a job. And he said, send him in anything to break the day up. Send, send him in. So I go back and I'm talking to Arthur and Arthur, I got to say, just one of the, the real sweethearts, really nice guy, lovely guy. And Arthur sits me down. We start talking and he's asking me a few questions and whatnot. And I tell him that I had been working as a 
newspaper editor and a military journalist. And I also mentioned I'd been writing short stories. Now, I hadn't sold any short stories at that point, but I had been writing and submitting and trying to, to sell stuff. So he said, well, you know, if you if you are ever back in this neck of the woods, he said, uh, I'd love to look at some of your short stories. You know, well, as I tell people, you don't have to bonk me over the head, you know. So I go back to where we were staying. I get out some short stories I had. And the next week I go over to Arthur, visit him again, and I drop off a few of these short stories. And while I'm there, he's, he says, now, we've got a show that we're going to do that – we're having problems with because it's really difficult to come up with stories with it. He said, I can't ask you to develop stories, but if you on your own were to come up with some story ideas and wanted to pitch them, I'd be happy to listen to them. Well, again, you don't have to bonk me over the head. So I go back, drag out my typewriter. I come up with a bunch of story ideas. And the following week, I show up with, you know, I forget how many it was, maybe Six or eight at the most. Not even, I don't even think I, I maybe turned, maybe eight, but six or eight, somewhere in that range. So I come back to where I was staying. And what I didn't know was that Arthur, after he had read my short stories, had sent them by FedEx to Hawaii, where Lou Scheimer, who was one of the chief producers, he was one of the two guys that uh, ran Filmation. Um, he sent them to Lou Scheimer, who was vacationing in Hawaii at that time. And you got to remember, this is 1978. FedExing something to Hawaii is a big deal in 1978. Um, so Lou got my short stories in Hawaii. And when he came back to the U.S., uh, sitting on his desk were these story ideas that I had come up with. And Lou called Arthur and said, uh, you know, I don't know who we should hire. Should we hire the guy who wrote the short stories or should we hire the guy who wrote the outlines, the uh, the ideas? And Arthur said, they're the same guy. And Lou said, get him. So I, I get a phone call from Arthur. and He says, uh, would you like to come in and, and do a script for us? And it was a it was a test to see, you know, how how well I worked. And I, I wrote a script that I found it decades later and i was reading it and going holy crap this is awful this is the worst thing i've ever read you know but it was the first thing i had ever written with you know some hope of selling and they looked at it and they said well it's yeah okay would you like to be on staff and i said sure and because that that's a lot better than a mail room isn't it <laughs> anyway so they put me on staff as an animation writer met a bunch of wonderful people there when October came around and the film school was going to start, I was thinking, you know, I'm making a fair amount of money here writing animation. It won't hurt to put film school back one year to uh, just keep making a little more money, build a little more of a nest egg, and then I'll go to film school next year. Well, next year never came. So that's the sum total of uh, my formal education, and it's the sum total of, uh, you know, how I got involved in animation in the first place. What was the name of that show that you were first hired to write for? As best I can recall, it was Sunlight and Starbright or something like that. Uh, we, we were making fun of the names. I mean, we call it like Ultra Bright and Erudite and... Uh, Jebusite and Malachite, you know, if you're biblical or something like that. And the premise was there were there were two twin girls and one of them got superpowers in the daytime and the other one got superpowers at night. And if you've ever seen the movie uh, Lady Hawk, you know, they they use the same idea in Lady Hawk. But I think I think our guy, I think Filmation came up with it first. I'm not 100 percent sure. But anyway, so they had two sisters. And to give you an idea of, of just how difficult a person I am to deal with, uh, they give me the Bible for the show and they say uh, they're, they're identical twin sisters. And uh, one of them has blonde hair and one of them is a brunette. And I said, well, they're not identical then, are they? Because if they're identical, they're going to have the same hair color. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're right. So, you know, we just mentioned they're twins, but they were they were technically fraternal twins. I almost introduced sex to Saturday morning with this this uh, series. And, and, it, and the thing is, it never got to series because they were having such a hard time coming up with story ideas 
they they finally just gave up and they they removed the segment. It was going to be part of Tarzan and the Super Seven, and they just removed the segment completely. And we went on with the other characters that we had in the series, but we didn't do anything with Starlight and Sunbright. Uh, but I was going to, as I said, I was going to introduce sex to Saturday morning because I was going to do a story where they're trying to catch a unicorn and one of the girls can get, can't get anywhere near the unicorn and the other one catches it quite easily. And of course, if you know medieval mythology, only a virgin can capture a unicorn. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was, you know, I was planning to sneak that one in, but we never got far enough to do that. What was the first piece of animation that you're aware of that actually did end up making it to air that you wrote? It would have been one of the segments of Tarzan and the Super 7. And I'm trying to remember exactly which one it might have been. Uh, the segments included Manta and Moray, which were two aquatic underwater characters. It included uh, Super Stretch and Micro Woman. They were African-American characters and and. Super Stretch could stretch and, uh, you know, Micro Woman could shrink down. And we had Web Woman, which is, you know, to be brutally honest, was a uh, Spider-Man knockoff. And then we had, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It might have been called the Freedom Force. I'm, I'm, I'm misremembering, and it's entirely possible I'm misremembering the name here. But it was basically all of these mythological heroes like Sinbad and all these other mythological characters who are all, you know, grouped together and they'd go out and, you know, solve mysteries and, you know, fight crime and supervillains and whatnot. And it was kind of, they could travel through time and across dimensions. So, you know, we could do virtually any kind of a story we wanted. So one of those, not, not the one with the, the super, not the one with Sinbad in it, but one of the other three was the first one that I actually wrote that got animated and that I actually saw on the screen. Did you ever write for any of the live action segments on uh, Tarzan and the Super 7 or any of the filmation programs? No, I didn't. And I, I wanted to. And if I had been a little more savvy, I might have, uh, might have negotiated where I could have gotten one because we were working for a time because they, one year they sold so much animation, they had to move the writers out of the main filmation building into the live action studio. Now, the live action studio, to be honest with you, was really nothing but, you know, a, a very typical commercial building, uh, Canoga Park. It, you know, you could use it as a warehouse, you could use it as a shop. They put in a few sets and they, they turned it into uh, Space Academy and then the sets of uh, Jason of Star Command. And when I was there, you know, I, I would wander around and look at all these sets. And they had this huge air conditioning unit because, you know, this building, California, it gets pretty hot. And they had this huge air conditioning unit that they would turn on when they weren't filming. And then the moment they started filming, they'd turn it off because it was too noisy and they'd shoot for as long as they could, and then, you know, when it got too hot, they'd turn the air conditioning back on again. And I saw this big air conditioning unit, and I told Lou Scheimer, I said, I can I can give you a brand new set for nothing more than a coat of paint. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. And I took him over to the air conditioning unit, and I pointed at it, and I said, paint this thing the same colors as the stuff in Space Academy, put some futuristic-looking numbers on it, and it's it's a reactor. It's a nuclear reactor. Wow, what a great idea. And, you know, of course, he immediately done it. And I should have negotiated. I should have said, you know, I'll, I'll show you where you can get a brand new set if you let me write a story about it. But I didn't. So I never ended up writing any live action for Filmation. Could you describe the quality of the animation that was coming out of Filmation at that time? <laughs> and you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Quality is not a word I would use. Would you describe <laughs> the, the type of animation that was coming out of Filmation at the time? Yeah, I'll describe the type. We had a joke around the studio. We we had come. Somebody had come up with a concept called the Offstage Kids, and it was basically you know you got to imagine this is like the Cats and Jammer Kid voices, but there's a, there's just a picture of a bush. And off stage, you hear the Cats and Jammer kids go, well, what are we going to do today? Let's go over by the bush. No, I don't want to go by the bush. Let's stay over here. Okay, we'll stay. Over. And, you know, basically, all you had was just a picture of a bush for 30 minutes. <laughs> that, 
that was pretty much what what filmation's animation quality was. What made the filmation shows distinctive was that they put a lot of emphasis in the scripts and the story. And as a result, they had better writing than most studios had at that time because that's they could afford that. They could they could demand more of the writers than they could of the animators. Not that the animators were bad, but the the, the animators were constrained by union rules on how much you get paid for how much of a certain type of work. And depending upon the quality of the animation, if you're doing full animation or what they called half animation or skip animation, you got paid at different rates. So since they couldn't afford to pay these people to do full animation, they used, you know, the, the, the least expensive forms of animation that they could. And they did all kinds of, of tricks. If you've ever seen any of the old Archie shows that Filmation did, Mm-hmm. Almost all the dialogue scenes are shot over the shoulder of the character that's speaking, and the character they're talking to is just sitting there looking, and every now and then blinks their eyes. That's because when you do it that way, you don't have to synchronize the lips. You don't have to animate the lips of the character to the dialogue. So as a result, their dialogue scenes in the Archies would always cut back and forth over the shoulder who, of whoever was talking. They would never move their lips if they could avoid it on screen. The Star Trek show, they used to love to zoom in to close-ups of eyes because when you come in real close on the eyes of these characters, you don't have to animate the mouth. They would hand us these, these notebooks, thick notebooks that were filled with stock shots. And these were shots for Tarzan, um, for all of the shows that they had done where they, they, it would be stuff like Tarzan running or jumping or doing all these things. And they told us, they said, when you write scripts, go through and call out specific scenes, call out specific stock motion actions. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to animate anything new if we can possibly avoid it. So that's why in the filmation stuff, you see the same animation being used again and again and again. I mean, the character runs this way, the character runs that way. The last four Fat Alberts that they did had no new animation in them at all. It was all stock footage that uh, they had saved and just found different ways of putting it together. So filmation was notoriously bad on quality. I mean, give them, give them credit. They kept they kept the work inside the U.S. as long as they possibly could. I mean, a lot longer than anybody else did. And they never did what was called negative financing, which is where they borrow money to do the animation, you know, to a high standard in the hopes of making the money back when it goes into syndication. Uh, Lou Scheimer's philosophy was always, I'm, I'm going to turn a profit, you know, off of the network sale alone. Anything else will be gravy. But I'm not going into debt for a network. That's that's the quality level at Filmation. Could you describe Lou Scheimer and what it was like working with him? Lou was a nice guy. I mean, he was a big blustery guy, but he was nice blustery. I mean, he wasn't one of these, um, you know, nasty type. He was actually kind of sensitive in a way. I mean, sensitive in the sense that he was aware of people's feelings. He was aware of his responsibility as a producer. Uh Arthur told me, he said at one point Lou had been approached to do a skateboard show and he had looked at it. And because at that time they weren't, you know, emphasizing pads and helmets for skateboarders, he thought, no, I, I, even though we would make money doing this, I wouldn't feel right, you know, doing a show that encourages people to go out and do dangerous stuff. And Arthur said he could have, he could have practically hugged Lou at that point because Lou was willing to say, okay, I'm, there are certain lines I won't cross. He was, he was, I don't want to use the word penny pincher because that, that implies somebody who wasn't willing to spend money. And when he absolutely had to, he would spend the money, but he would always try to find the least expensive and most efficient way of doing something. And that's, that's why he put all his emphasis on the writing instead of the animation because the, the writing, if it's a good script or a bad script, 
it's the same fee. It's the same script fee. So he could put pressure on the writers and say, you know, come up with something better. Do better jobs, you know, than you've been doing before. Come up with better stories. He couldn't do that with the animators and not end up paying them more because, you know, the the as I said, the animation, depending upon the type and style of animation, it affected how much you got paid. And how long did you work at Filmation? I worked at least 18 months, maybe closer to two years. Um, they kept me on the first year through what they called uh, hiatus. So it was an interesting experience. And then after that, Lou did not sell as many shows as he had hoped to sell. And when they had finished the next year's shows, he just did not have the money to keep me on. So he, he turned me loose and... I called up a few people that I knew at that time, and I think I did an episode of the new Schmoo for um, Hanna-Barbera, and I also ended up at Ruby Spears Studios, and I pitched a couple of ideas there. They didn't hire me at first because they had not gotten any pickups yet, but then I think they finally got something picked up a little early, and they had me come in and start doing some work on it. And... The first show that I wrote for at uh, Ruby Spears was the Plastic Man uh, Hour, which had a, in addition to the Plastic Man stories, had this backup short cartoon called Mighty Man and Yuck. And I never got to write any of the Plastic Man episodes, but I wrote several of the Mighty Man and Yuck episodes. And it was there that I met Steve Gerber and a bunch of other people. And from there, that was where... If, if Filmation was my entry into the animation career, Ruby Spears was where it really started, though. I mean, in the sense that I was <clears throat> I was starting to get a, a reputation for, you know, the quality of work I was doing. I'm not saying this is a brag. I'm just, you know, as Muhammad Ali says, it ain't bragging if you did it. I was getting recognized as be, being one, one of the better writers in the field. And I was, you know, I was I was working on some pretty good shows. I mean, at, at, for a time. Ruby Spears has had the best writing staff, some of the best creative staff in terms of um, art and, and stuff like that. And for two or three years, it was golden. And it was a really good time to be working there. And I met a lot of wonderful people there. Could you describe how long it took you to learn to write for an animation script? And what makes an animation script at that time different from, say, a live action script at that time? Well, an, an animation script at the time involved what we called writing, uh, directing on paper, not writing on paper, directing on paper, where you literally had to call every camera movement, every action, every little detail. As a result, animation scripts were typically twice as long as a live action script for the same length of time. If you were doing a 22 minute show, because that's you know, 22 minutes of actual animation for a show that would run in a half-hour slot. If you're doing a 22-minute sitcom, typically your script would only be about 22 pages long. If you're doing a 22-minute animation script, it's typically 44 to 45 pages long because, it's, again, you're, you're calling literally every single detail. As time went on, as more of the there was a, a return towards the more classic form of doing animated cartoons where they relied more heavily on the storyboards. As that came about, they started telling us, we, you don't have to be as detailed anymore. You don't have to put in every single little shot and angle and this, that, and the other thing. So as a result, the live action and animation scripts gradually got to be about the same length. So nowadays, for a typical animation script, I would say it's, it's roughly the same number of pages for an equivalent live action script. And how long would it take you to write the average seven-minute script for either Filmation or Ruby Spears? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll break down the process for you so because it's, it's not just a really easy answer to give. The first thing you do is you pitch a few ideas, and when they select an idea, you would then develop that up into a um, anywhere from a, a lengthy paragraph to, to a full page of what the story would be, the basic, the basic outline. Uh, and this is for like a short one, a seven minute one for one that would be longer. You know, you could run like three to five, you know, maybe even longer uh, pages for an outline. You would write this outline up 
and again, depending upon how long the the final thing was going to be, that could be an afternoon's work. It could be, you know, I sometimes was able to write two in a single afternoon. I would get, you know, two ideas would be approved and I'd have a fairly good idea of what I wanted to do with them. And I could I could knock out two short outlines in a single afternoon. Generally, it, it would take one day max to do an outline. More than a few times, I'm sure I, I stretched it out for you know various reasons because I didn't want to make it look like I was turning the stuff in too fast. But more than once, I'm, I'm, I, it took a couple of days to write one. But when I had to, I could write an outline easily in one day. Writing the actual script itself, again, varied. This could depend on any number of factors. At Filmation, you're spending a lot of time going through those stock books. You know, well, what run do I want to pick this time? Okay, we'll have them run this way. At Ruby Spears, uh, I spent a lot of time talking with the storyboard department and with the animators. And as a result, I got a better feel of what they could and couldn't do in a story. So I would write stuff that would be easier for them to animate than some of the other ways of approaching something. So I would, I would sit and try to figure out what's, what's going to give us the best looking image, but will be the easiest thing to animate. If I had, you know, if I, if, if I came in one morning and somebody said, you know, we need to have a, a seven minute cartoon by the end of the day. Yeah, I could write that seven minute cartoon by the end of the day. I have on more than one occasion when it was an emergency, uh, written a script literally overnight because we just had a, a hold plug and it, it, something had to go in there. The, that, that happened more at uh, Sunbow where we're doing, you know, we, I described it as it's like there's a freight train going by and every day, uh, every day an open box car goes past you and something has to go in that box car every day something has to go in and so we would sometimes you know get a script from somebody and it would be late and it would not be usable and okay i'm not i'm not going to waste time trying to fix it i am just going to take the outline and rewrite the whole thing you know from the ground up because we i don't it's actually faster for me to write something brand new than to try to fix something that's got problems in it, if you follow me. Yeah. So I, I would like to take a week, at least a week, to do a script because I didn't want to make it seem too easy or, you know, I could blitz this stuff out too fast. But the truth is it rarely took me more than two or three days to write a half-hour animation script. And when absolutely gunned my head i could i could do one overnight when you were at uh, ruby spears did you work directly with joe ruby and ken spears oh yeah what were they like i loved both of these guys okay ken is a very erudite swab i mean just he is just this really cool and i i don't want to use the word sophisticated because that makes it you know a little too high toned if you know what i mean but he's Really well read. I mean, just really cool guy. And I love Joe too, but Joe is like the diametric opposite of Ken. And Joe is your classic cigar chomping, uh, yeah, yeah, give me this guy on the phone. I want to talk to him type producer. And I don't know how much of that is, is actually Joe. And I don't know how much of that is Joe fulfilling in his mind what he thought a producer should be like. But that was kind of Joe's way of doing stuff. And Joe and Ken, both wonderful guys. I had great relationships with both of them. Joe has the patience of Job because, man, I did stuff that I would have fired myself for time and again. And he put up with it. He just, you know, grit his teeth. And, you know, he'd sometimes get on my case. But and again, I'm, what I'm about to say is not said as a brag. It's just relaying what other people have said. But Steve Gerber once said, you know, Joe Ruby's downfall came when he stopped listening to every third idea from Buzz. Because the first two ideas from Buzz are horrifying. The third one is gold. And you just have to put up with the two horrifying ideas to get to the gold one. So was he not listening to any of the three or was he listening to all three? 
Oh, he was listening to all three. Wow. He's like, you know, the first two are like, is like, oh my God, who's this maniac? And then the third one comes out and, you know, it's like, well, all right, this is why we keep him on staff. You know, and I'm, what I'm about to say again, I'm not trying to sound like I'm bragging. I'm just acknowledging these are my particular strengths as a writer and a story editor. I know story very well. And if, if I'm reading a story and I look at it, I can immediately identify what are the problems here? What needs to be strengthened? What can we jettison? I can, I can look at something and, and see what needs to be done to make it better. Okay. And that's a very good strength when it comes to being an editor, obviously. Uh, when I'm pitching story ideas, I typically will come up with some oddball approach to the material that nobody else will think of. And then you do it and you go, well, wow, that kind of like amplifies and that that does a lot of good with what we're trying to do. That really kind of brings forth a lot of the ideas that are hidden in this series that we didn't even recognize were there. So. These are these are strengths that I can bring to something. And they're one of the reasons why, you know, I, I had such a good run at Sunbow. And I went over and we were doing G.I. Joe and Transformers, which we'll get to. Joe, he had a predilection to put his stamp on everything that came out of the studio. And to a certain degree, that's good because, you number one, you, you want it to reflect your value. Number two, you want it to be in your style so that people will look at it and recognize, yeah, that's that's that guy's work. I mean, it's like, you know, Max Sennett and Hal Roach. They were famous for comedies. They they also produced dramatic films. People don't realize this, but nobody remembers them from their dramatic films. They remember them from their comedies. So, yeah, you, you want to have something that's distinct, that's yours. And when people see it, they go, oh, it's that guy's work. The drawback was that once Joe got fixated on an idea, it was impossible to veer him away from it. And a lot of times we would point out holes, problems in material that we were working on. And instead of going, hmm, you're right, why don't we change that and do something else with it? He would dig his heels in. And this happened on more than one occasion. Um, and it, it, it almost never happened to a way that ended up beneficial for the, the project. We might sell the project, but it, it didn't make it any easier to tell stories or do anything with it and became problematic in other areas. That's why we, you know, Ruby Spears got a reputation for doing these really crazy oddball shows they did dingbat in the creeps which was basically the three stooges as monsters and and curly was a fat skeleton okay that's joe's idea well we did the uh the mork and mindy show the animated mork and mindy show we did uh, uh pac-man if i remember correctly there was a ton of stuff we did that we would we would argue with Joe and say, no, Joe, let's do it this way. I mean, I'll give you an example with uh, Qbert. We did a Gary Gary Greenfield and I were given the task of developing a show around the Qbert game. And if you remember Qbert, mm-hmm. it, the 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 gameplay involves um, you. Your, your orientation changes, your, your orientation in space changes because you're jumping up and down in this pyramid. But depending on which way you look at it, up, down is in a different direction for each set of characters. So Gary and I went back and we were kicking ideas around and we came to realize Qbert, the game, is essentially the roadrunner in Coyote, but in three dimensions. It's not just running along the road. It's moving your, your perspective, everything changes in this. And so we came up with this, you know, the equivalent of the Roadrunner, you know, in three dimensions. And we built all the gags around uh, these characters working this way, how they operate, all this sort of stuff. 
And we came up with, if I say so myself, a fairly decent show. I mean, it would have been a lot of fun to do. It would have had a very odd, distinctive look to it. But it would have been, it would have been faithful to the Kubert game. We take this thing in when we finish it to Joe. And I'm not kidding you. Joe literally takes it out of our hands, throws it in the trash, and says, I want to do Kubert as happy days. And it's like, no, Joe, that's not what Kubert is. There is nothing happy days about Kubert. He wouldn't listen. He had set in his mind what it was going to be. And so the Kubert show was essentially uh, happy days in Kubert track. When you were writing a show like Saturday Supercade, when you had the Kubert character or the Capcom, did you get any sort of notes or any sort of uh, representation from the various video game companies that owned those characters when you were writing your scripts? I do not recall receiving anything like that. Joe may have received something like that. I never got anything of that nature. So that's all I can say. I, I can't recall anything more detailed than that. I have a couple of shows that you are credited with writing for at Ruby Spears. I say credited because you know things shift a lot, and I don't know. If, but just if you had any memories of these shows, uh, okay, whatever they may be, uh, Heathcliff. I seem to recall I did some work on that show. I can't remember if I wrote an episode, if I actually wrote episodes, or if I would contribute story material like gags or bits or something like that. So I remember working on it. I, I don't have anything stronger than that to go with. Okay. Thundar the Barbarian? Oh, my goodness. Thundar, yeah. Thundar was, that was the golden moment. Um, Steve Gerber had managed, uh, and, and there's a great question as to exactly who came up with the idea. And... I think Joe has the credit for the kernel of the idea that Joe wanted to do some kind of barbarian fantasy story. And this, of course, is long before He-Man, long before, you know, Conan really got big. Um, he had some idea that he wanted to do something like that. And I think Steve Gerber and Marty Pasco, between the two of them, developed what was the first recognizable version of, of what eventually became Thundar. They were the ones to come up with the idea that it was set in the future, not in the distant past, and it involved uh, a combination of magic and technology. So Steve was leading the charge on that. Uh, he, was, he was getting the writing staff together. He recommended that Jack Kirby be brought on board to do designs for us, and that was an incredible, I mean, I got to meet Jack Kirby, became friends with him. We worked closely together. Just tons of fun working with Jack. It's like one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. Um, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. Never worked on those. My name gets slapped onto the end credits of a lot of shows because uh, Ruby Spears operated on, on what was called the gang credit system, which was instead of crediting a writer or a storyboard artist with a particular show that they worked on, they would just put a big, you know, this is the writing staff at the end. And typically they just listed everybody who had written anything for the show in any shape, fashion, or form. And sometimes they just go, well, put all the staff writers on and then uh, all the freelancers who worked on the show. And that, that was how your, your credits were determined back then. There were, there were no individual credits at Ruby Spears. Other than the fact that historians like me occasionally mess that up, how did you feel about the fact that you were credited with things you did not do? And well, I'm not happy about it. I mean, um, one of the things about Filmation was that Filmation, to save money, wouldn't put a title card on their episodes. But to differentiate the episodes, they would give a writing credit. So the very first credit that would come on when the story started would be written by and then, you know, whoever the writer was. They were not required to do this. I mean, the, the union rules didn't require them to, to give this kind of credit, but it was one of the ways that they managed to get better work out of writers, which was, hey, 
Hanna-Barbera, Ruby Spears, they're not going to give you individual credit. You'll get individual credit here. So, you know, we complained about that quite a bit. We, we were constantly asking, why aren't we getting individual writing credits when, uh, you know, everybody else seems to be able to do it? And it was just, you know, they, they were, uh, I would say stuck in their ways, but this is the way it had always been done and they couldn't imagine doing it any differently. And, you know, after I left the studio, I think they finally broke down and started giving individual credit on stuff, but I was gone by that point. Uh, before you left, uh, did, you did in fact write for Alvin and the Chipmunks. I hope I'm right in that. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. What do you remember about a lot that? Of fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Um, one of my quintessential Hollywood stories is, um, I, my car had broken down. And while it was in the shop, I was taking the bus to work. And um, I'm standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus to come along. And Ross Bagdasarian Jr. and his wife, who were the producers of the Chipmunk Show, uh, they come by and uh, they had just sold the second season. Without slowing down, they yell at me, hey, we just sold a second season of Chipmunks. You want to write some? I said, sure. And they kept going and... <laughs> you know that's uh that's about as hollywood as it gets so um easy job interview yeah well i'd already worked with him i mean i had already done some episodes in, in season one and it was tons of fun i mean i liked uh, ross jr and his wife were just tons of fun and i grew up with the chipmunks you know on tv in the original show and it was a lot of fun there so it was a chance to get something that i had worked on you know, it's something that was from my childhood that I had enjoyed and chance to work on it. And actually, you know, the animation was better and the songs were better, to be honest with you. So I was very happy with it. So why did you ultimately leave Ruby Spears? There was a business affairs person who I'm trying to phrase this as nicely as possible. Was difficult? Uh, yes. And the business affairs person one day came into the writers the writers had like a, a a staff room we all had individual offices but there was also a room where we could congregate if the need be and we were we were all sitting in there and the the business affairs person came in and i forget what they came in to talk about but at some point the business affairs person flatly stated you are not here to be creative Joe is the creative person. You are just here to execute Joe's ideas. And within minutes of that person leaving, we were all on the phone calling our agents, calling other animation studios. You know, have you got anything open? Because, you know, if, if that's their attitude, we're not going to sit around. And within the space of like three weeks, Ruby Spears lost like 70 percent of its of its writing staff it was just like nah, really is that your attitude fine you you just be the creative genius all you want to be now to joe's credit it must be pointed out joe had no idea that this person said this he did not send this person in there to convey that information this business affairs person took it upon themselves to do that and the business affairs person was not very efficient in business affairs. There were other problems that were arising. And the upshot of this was that, uh, well, first off, you know, when he lost his writing staff, he, he lost a lot of what gave him an edge over other animation studios. And Ruby Spears began a very fast spiral at that point. They were already on a decline, but without strong writing to pull them out, they just went faster. When he found out that this business affairs person had done this, in addition to other things that the business affairs person had had done, Joe and Ken invited the business affairs person to lunch. And the business affairs person went along apparently thinking they were going to discuss renegotiating their contract, you know, re-upping their contract. And while they were at lunch, um, they boxed up all of the business affairs person's personal belongings and they got a locksmith to change the lock on the doors. And uh, when dessert arrived at lunch, he, uh, they told him, by the way, you're fired and uh, you'll, you can pick up your stuff in the lobby. So uh, it was a it was a hard goodbye. 
but uh, for those of us who heard this story afterwards, we all went, mm, yeah, it well deserved, but uh, still a hard goodbye. So did you call your agent immediately after that, or did you, how oh, did you within, get hired? Within minutes, within minutes. And how did he, what was the next job he got you after that, or she? Well, she got me. Sorry, it was, um, I corrected myself. Uh, Candy Montero, I believe, at the time. I'm trying to remember exactly what happened and when and where. I do know the first big one that came about was the Dungeons and Dragons script that I wrote. They were doing Dungeons and Dragons, and as I recall, they had already filled up the show. They had already decided on all the scripts that they wanted to do. But someone as a favor let me pitch a story idea and... They liked it so much, they made a space for me. They, they said, yeah, we, we want to do this story. And the one that I did was called Quest of the Skeleton Warrior. And I like to point to that one as the first time I got a script on the air that reflected something value-wise, storytelling value-wise, something I found important. Because one of the things that annoyed me about so much animation writing was it was very simplistic, black and white, good guy, bad guy stuff. And the example I would give would be, you know, uh, Joker steals the Eiffel Tower and Batman has to get it back. And I said, who's going to miss a meal if the Eiffel Tower is stolen? Who's going to go hungry? Who is going to suffer? I mean, it's just, you know, it's a big grandiose crime that doesn't make any sense. You have to have a, a human element. You have to have an emotional element. And I tried putting this into the Thundar scripts we were doing. But, you know, the Thundar scripts, you could kind of allude to that, but you really couldn't focus on it. You know, it was like, oh, the bad guy did this and these people are starving and we're going to have to do something about it. That sort of thing. Really not getting into the, the crux of the matter. Quest of the Skeleton Warrior was the first time I was allowed to create a sympathetic villain. And, and basically, the guy is a skeleton warrior, and he wants to become human again. But the chief bad guy of the series is telling him, I can make you human again, but you've got to do in these kids. Well, you know, that's that's a motive you can understand. That's a motive that you, you may not you may not take the bad guy up on that offer, but you can certainly understand somebody else taking the guy up on the offer. And I created this story. I wrote this story about this guy having this conflict. I mean, on the one hand, I I want to be human again. On the other hand, is it worth being human again if I have to give up all my honor? You know, Uh, and at the same time, the, the other part of the story was that the the villain was using the character's own fears, what they were afraid of against them. And not just simplistic stuff like, oh, here's a spider or here's a snake. But, you know, the the youngest kid in the story, he fears being perceived as the baby of the group, not being taken seriously. So, so for, for him, he's literally de-aging. He's getting younger and younger. He's becoming an infant. Um, one of the girls in it is afraid of getting old, afraid of becoming decrepit, and that happens to her. And so everything that happened to those characters reflects a very real type of fear, not a magical fear, not a fear of a bug or a spider or anything like that, but a fear that you know people do have in their hearts. And I was very happy with this because it was like the first time I had gotten to write something that actually touched on, you know, moral, ethical issues this way and actually touched on what people really feel and think deep inside. And you know, the result has been that, that that is the episode that a lot of people remember very fondly. And I've had people talking to me about it and asking me about it for years afterwards. So I'm I'm very happy with the way that came out. I was very pleased with with not just the technical animation, but the way the story worked as a whole. What do you think makes a Buzz Dixon script different from, say, a Sean Derrick script or another animation writer, or Christy Marks script? Well, first off, let me say, Christy, I, I, I am unfit to carry her pencil case. Christy is just a tremendously wonderful writer. 
she wrote the only G.I. Joe episode that she turned it in. We looked at it and went, nothing to do here. <laughs> she turned in a perfect script. Just send it on to the animators. I mean, literally. No editing at all. Just bingo. Right on the money. Let it go. Even even in-house, even the guys that were writing the stories in-house, you'd write it and it would have to go to somebody to backstop. And the person who's the backstop, you know, another editor or somebody would just look it over and, oh, you did this, you did that. Let's fix this thing. It would usually be very, very minor, but everybody had something, you know. And, and of course, Sunbow and Hasbro would have their input. But Christy, perfect from the very beginning. As to what makes my scripts different, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to the thing I was talking about, you know, every every third idea. I take a very offbeat, oddball approach to everything I do. And I try not to think of the most obvious or easiest way of approaching something. If I'm going to do a story... I want to do something that has not been done before, approaches it in a different manner. I'm trying to think of a good example I can give you right off the top of my head. Oh, well, a Lights, Camera, Cobra for G.I. Joe. My my first thought was, we we have got this basically drunken sailor character, Shipwreck, and we never get him to act the way that, you know, he would act. And so what can we do? What what story can we do where he gets to act like the goofball he is, but it doesn't undermine, you know, the mission. It doesn't make him look like a bad guy. So I come up with this story where he is he is basically sent to Hollywood to be a, a technical advisor on a movie because they just want to get him out of their hair at Joe headquarters. And he you know, proceeds to get involved in all kinds of, of oddball adventures in Hollywood and, you know, Cobra's involved, everything. But the point was, it wasn't a simple, oh, Cobra's going to steal this, so we have to stop him type story. It was a story that goes off in an entirely different direction. The opening of it has what appears to be a G.I. Joe versus Cobra battle. But you're looking at it and going, well, wait a minute, that's not the G.I. Joe vehicles. Those aren't the Cobra vehicles. That doesn't look like Duke. And then you realize, no, it's not. It's a movie that they're shooting. And and none of it, you know, it, it, it looks bad because they're not able to use any of the equipment that the Joes have. And at that point, the producer pulls a few strings and he gets the Joes to, you know, supply some vehicles and some technical advice. And, of course, we then find out that one of the captured Cobra vehicles has really got something hidden on it that, you know, Cobra wants to get back. But we've approached the story from an entirely different angle. It's not the angle that you were expecting to see. This is what happened with uh, 20 Questions. It's what happened with the traitor. It's we've got this ongoing battle between the Joes and Cobra. That we don't have to worry about. We will always have that conflict to fall back on. What is the approach to that conflict? What is it that we can do in this episode that is different from other episodes? And again, this goes back to what I had said about if the Joker steals the Eiffel Tower, if he steals the Washington Monument, if he steals the St. Louis Ark, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just him doing something and then arbitrarily chasing around for however many minutes until you catch him. But if somebody has a vested interest in what's going on, if somebody is going to personally benefit or lose either emotionally or physically or financially from what's happening, then your, your audience gets caught up in it. Then your audience wants to go, well, what's going to happen here? How will this work out? That would be what I would say is how I approach stories. I don't want to approach them in the, the standard, easy to do, most obvious fashion. How did you end up working on G.I. Joe? Well, uh, as through much of my career, thanks to Steve Gerber, uh, Steve had left Ruby Spears about the same time that uh, the mass exodus occurred after the business affairs person shot off their mouth. I think Steve had... He wasn't the story editor, but he had some connection with 
Dungeons and Dragons. And he, ma- I, I think he was the one who managed to get me the courtesy read of pitching a story to him. And, you know, I did well enough that they decided to in- include it, even though they had officially closed. Steve was then tapped to be the story editor on G.I. Joe. And I was not picked. They had already picked the story editor and the staff writers for G.I. Joe. And I had not been in the first pick of writers that they wanted. They had already gotten the people they had wanted. There were going to be some freelance scripts available. They knew that because they knew that they couldn't get the the staff writers to write everything. But they they were planning to use few freelancers as possible and try to rely more heavily on the staff writers. Well, I had seen the two miniseries that had been done up to that point, and Steve, knowing I had been in the Army for six years, he said, can I send you a couple of the scripts and you take a look at them and tell me what you like and what you think about them? You know, he's just saying for technical feedback on the the way that the, the military is depicted. Well, if you remember the first two miniseries, they've got stuff like jets flying down and slicing tanks in half with their wingtips and they've got sergeants issuing orders to colonels and things like this and i i told steve i said you know this doesn't resemble in any shape fashion or form any military unit and i explained you know the chain of command is wrong you've got basic military protocol and military etiquette is not being followed and i I gave him just like a, a laundry list of stuff that that was just problematic for me in it and he thanked me and he called up Sunbow and Hasbro and said, you know, I really think we ought to put Buzz on as a technical advisor and explain, you know, Buzz is a writer, but he was in the army for six years and he knows something about this and he can at least give us um, advice on when we're going too far afield. So they weren't, you know, they didn't have any budget for a technical advisor, but they said, well, let him, let him write a script and if, if uh, we'll see how the script works and, we may hire him as a staff writer. So I wrote a script for them called Hall Down the Heavens. That was the first script I wrote for them. And it's interesting because uh, up to that time, everybody who had been working in network television just had these terrible restrictions regarding violence, language, things like this. And basically, we were allowed to throw punches and hit people in G.I. Joe. I mean, you couldn't do that in Saturday morning. And we could, you know, we could fire rockets at people and blow stuff up. The first script everybody wrote for G.I. Joe, their very first script was always this balls to the wall, blow everything up story. And then once they got it out of their system, they'd come back and say, uh, I, I don't have to do that all the time, do I? I can do something different the next time, right? And that's what made G.I. Joe and Transformers so successful, I believe, was that Hasbro and Sunbro had this common sense to say, yeah, you're the creative guys. As long as it's entertaining and it doesn't violate the, the basic premise of the show, you guys just come up with stories. You know, if, if we think you're going far afield, we'll tell you, but you just come up with the stories. And as a result, we ended up doing a lot of very different stories, a lot of different points of view. Um, it, it made it a very strong series, in my my opinion. But anyway, um, how I got involved was after I wrote Hall Down the Heavens. Um, I was I, I had barely turned it in when they asked if I wanted to come on staff. And of course, yes, I'd be delighted to come on staff. And. Almost immediately, I was an unofficial story editor because, as I said, being being the only person there with any military experience, at, at least in the writing staff, I was the first person that, you know, they'd run all the scripts through and they'd come over and say, here, take a look at this. And I would look at it and just comment on the military aspects of it and then pass it on to Steve for the story editor. Well, it wasn't long before I became I went from unofficial story editor to official assistant story editor and then for the second season i was the story editor for the entire series so you wrote a number of episodes the one that i will Mm -hmm. single out which is the one i like the most which was 20 questions Mm -hmm. what makes that up first of all describe that episode and second of all what makes that different from the typical saturday from the typical saturday morning cartoons that had preceded it well the origin of 20 questions was 
Geraldo Rivera had been doing these incredibly stupid, quote unquote, live specials on TV, like um, Al Capone's Vault. Al Capone's Vault. But he also did one. Uh, the eighties were it was the time when they had what was called the Satanic Panic going on. This was when the McMartin case was was going on. This was when people all around the country were being accused of being involved in satanic cults and you know molesting kids and things like this. Almost almost every single case turning out to be completely spurious. And the few cases where they were able to prove it, it turned out that. A, a molester would deliberately introduce the satanic elements in order to discredit the kid when the kid were ever to blow the whistle on him. So there was no satanic cult out there molesting kids. But that's what people believed at the time. And Geraldo Rivera did this special where he had a woman on who was supposedly the victim of one of these cults and she had been horribly abused and forced to breed children who were then sacrificed. And I'm watching this thing, and it's this poor woman is obviously mentally ill. I mean, just completely, I mean, almost to the point of being catatonic, okay? And I'm thinking, what kind of a monster takes a mentally ill person like this and puts them on the air and, and claims their story is true and does nothing to help that person, but does everything imaginable to, to only reinforce their delusion, only to reinforce the, the, the mental illness that they're suffering from. And so I was really pissed off at Geraldo Rivera. And we're, we're doing episodes of the show, and I thought I would like to just make a comment on that kind of mentality. So I came up with this idea of doing a newspaper report, not a newspaper, excuse me, a TV reporter who uh, believes the whole G.I. Joe Cobra battle is a hoax. It's all it's all being done just to, to you know, take taxpayer money and this, that and the other thing. Very, very similar to what we hear other people saying about other things. So the the focus was this was the, you know, he was trying to do this expose. And <clears throat> again, they they put shipwreck in charge just to, you know, get shipwreck out of their hair and basically to keep this reporter as far away as they can. But shipwreck can't avoid responding to the reporter's bait. And he takes the reporter up on it to prove that Cobra really exists. And they go out to where there's been a report of Cobra activity. And sure enough, there's something going on. Cobra's got some, you know, big plans, you know, involving tunneling underground. And in the course of the show, not only does the Geraldo Rivera character, who I, my, my character was called Hector Ramirez, not only is he uh, learns that it really is true, but he also comes away with this great scoop, you know, this, all this stuff about this you know, huge underground battle that G.I. Joe and Cobra had. And part of it involved laughing gas getting released during the battle. And everybody is just literally hilarious. I mean, they're all falling over. Both sides are falling over themselves in laughter while they're fighting one another. And in the end, it's like everybody is stoned or drunk out of their mind, except for Duke. And, and Duke says to the, the equivalent, you know, what's been going on here? Or maybe on second thought, I don't really want to know. And again, I'm, I'm approaching the story in an entirely different way. I mean, a conventional approach to the story is, you know, they find out Cobra's doing something, they go to investigate, they stumble across the underground base, yada, yada. I brought in a different angle of approach, and we, we created the Hector Ramirez character for that. Now, before I go on, I'll explain when we're developing characters for animation, you have the name, you have the look of the character, but it has to be approved by the legal affairs department. And what the legal affairs department will do is check and make sure there is no living person with that name, with that occupation. So if there was a real Hector Ramirez, who was a TV reporter, we would have gotten a note from legal affairs saying, you can't use this name, come up with a different one. 
So there was no Hector Ramirez, who was a TV reporter. The fact that he looked enough like Geraldo Rivera for people to get the joke was okay because he didn't look exactly like Geraldo Rivera. You know, same, same basic hair, the mustache, but that was about it. So we, we got the character's name approved. We got the character's design approved. A voice actor was cast for him and we do the episode. Skip ahead a couple of weeks and I'm doing The Traitor, which was a two-parter that I wrote. And again, this, this shows how I approach things differently. The standard way to open part two of a two-parter is in our last episode and blah, 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 you explain what happened and you show clips from the previous episode. I thought that's, that's kind of, you know, been done to death. We've got Geraldo Rivera. We've got a TV, not Geraldo Rivera. We've got Hector Ramirez. We've got a TV show, 20 questions that he's the host of. Why not open up with a news broadcast where Hector gets to recapitulate everything that went on in the previous episode, but in the form of a news broadcast? So we did it that way. The episode opens with, is one of the Joe team a traitor? And from there it built. Well, at that point, other writers began to realize, son of a gun, if I ever have to have a big info drop in my script, Hector Ramirez can deliver it. He can just pop up on his TV show, explain everything that needs to be explained, because that's his job, explaining stuff. And then you know, we, we can just get that information out there and out of the way and go on with the story. So he began popping up in other people's scripts. And I think Flint Dilly um, used him in a Transformers episode. And at that point, uh, he became the official spokesperson for virtually everything that we were doing. He popped up in a, in a couple of gem episodes. He popped up in humanoids. Um, and whenever, like I said, whenever you needed to have an info dump, all you had to do egg Hector out because Hector, as a reporter, logically would be expected to just blurt all this stuff out in one big block and then he could disappear from the story. So as a result, we ended up unifying most of the Sunbow shows. They're all in the same universe because they're all linked by Hector Ramirez. Did Geraldo Rivera, only because his name is now associated with it, did he ever, that you're aware of, become aware or even care about the Hector Ramirez character? I don't think he was ever aware of it. And if he became aware of it, he, he probably showed enough common sense not to say anything about it. Because... Uh, there's a story about William Randolph Hearst wanting to sue uh, Orson Welles over mm -hmm. Citizen Kane because Welles pretty obviously based Citizen Kane on, on Hearst's life. And Hearst lawyers told him, yeah, you're right. You have every right to be upset because the guy in the movie is the son of a bitch. But if you're going to so if you're going to sue Orson Welles, you're going to have to stand up in a court of law and swear that son of a bitch is me. Do you want that? And Hearst realized, no, I don't want to be known as that son of a bitch. And so he did nothing about it. I think it also falls under what would be called fair use for parody. You're allowed to to parody public figures and, and news news reporters are public figures. So we could you know, anybody can create a character based on a public figure. And as long as you are not directly imitating that person's look. And, and I don't want to get off on a sidetrack here because this is a really odd bit of law here. Mm -hmm. There have been actors and there are states who have successfully sued because people have done parodies of their likeness and did it more than what would be considered fair usage. The origin of this goes all the way back to the early 1960s Bela Lugosi Jr. sued a candy bar company because the candy bar company had these commercials done with hand puppets where one of the hand puppets was called Copycat and he was obviously based on Bela Lugosi and was doing the whole Bela Lugosi shtick. And Bela Lugosi Jr. sued saying, you know, that's my father's likeness, that's my father's character and image and doing it for commercial gain, that's wrong. And the courts agreed with him, and it, it established the precedent that you can't use a real person's likeness for commercial purposes. Now, 
here's where you get into the very fine hair splitting. You can probably do a Bela Lugosi throwaway gag in a cartoon and not have anything to worry about it because that's fair usage. If you're doing like a haunted house cartoon and one character pops out of the closet at some point and goes blah, 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 and then disappears, there's that's okay. That's considered fair usage. You are commenting, making a satirical reference to a real person. If you're doing a bunch of candy bar commercials where that parody character is being used and you're banking on people recognizing the parody character, that, that's not legit. So you see, it's a very, very fine line, but you know, we could, we could claim because there's never been an official Hector Ramirez um, uh, G.I. Joe figure and there never will be. Uh, there have been some people who have done some uh, custom jobs, but nobody's ever going to, you know, Hasbro is never going to do a Geraldo, uh, a Hector Ramirez action figure. So that's where the line gets drawn, basically. You mentioned all the shows that Hector Ramirez appears on, and I only ask this for the historical purpose. Do you get a credit or a fee anytime he's in one of those episodes or by virtue of the fact that Hasbro would have owned it? Did that just not apply to you in your case? Nobody who wrote for animation got residuals unless they had an agent or a lawyer who was skillful enough to negotiate them. I got paid when I delivered a script, and that was it. I, I have not seen one penny of royalties of residuals for all of these shows that I have done that have played. I've not seen any from American sources for any of these shows that I have done. Twice a year, the Writers Guild sends me a check, and it can be as little as 13 cents. I actually have that check on the wall of my office, a check for 13 cents. Or it can be up to a couple of hundred dollars, because other countries have laws that require the creators to be compensated whenever a program is shown in their country, regardless of what the country of origin practice is. So... Ecuador will send me, will send the Writers Guild every now and then, here are the, these shows, and these writers are uh, entitled to so much money based on the number of times their episodes ran. And we don't care that they aren't represented by the Writers Guild. We're going to give you guys the money and you worry about it. So twice a year, I get a check from the Writers Guild of America that basically says, you know, Ecuador, Colombia, and Argentina, Australia, all of these other countries, you know, here's the money you made. And like I say, sometimes it's, it's a few dollars. Sometimes I've been lucky and it's been a couple of hundred dollars, but that's it. I mean, I don't, if, if you haven't written live action, you're not going to get residuals. I only wrote one WGA endorsed product that actually got filmed. And uh, that's the only one that I ever got residuals on. And that was a Ruby Spears show. That was the Mr. T show. The, the there was like live action bumpers on it. And so when when Mr. T was still being syndicated, uh, those live action bumpers got me more money than I ever got for the script. With Hector Ramirez appearing in all the various uh, Hasbro shows, I want to talk about some of those shows and just any quick memories you may have on them. Transformers. Well, Transformers was mostly Flint Dilly's Ballywick. And I would help out occasionally because, you know, as I said, we had to have X amount of product coming out every day. And so sometimes one show or the other would say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're going to run short this week. We need somebody to rewrite this episode really fast for us to, to you know, get it to the animators. OK, sure, I can I can squeeze it in between a couple of Joe episodes and I'd, I'd do a rewrite and hand it back to him and off it would go. I wrote two or three Transformers officially by myself or co-wrote them with Flint. But there were also several where I did major rewrites and I never took credit for it because that's, you know, my, my opinion is as a story editor, you don't take credit for the writer's work. If you have to fix it, that's your job is fixing it. Your, your job is not to slap your name on it. There's probably a couple of Transformers that I had the lion's share of influence on what actually ended up on the screen, but my name isn't on it because, you know, I wasn't officially working on the show. I was officially working on G.I. Joe. It was fun. I mean, I enjoyed the Transformers episodes that I wrote, and uh, one of them, The God Gambit, 
that was another one that I got to do because it, it, we were allowed to touch on, you know, issues about religion and faith and how people misuse that. The story is that both the Autobots and the Decepticons become aware that there is an energy source on Titan around Saturn. And there is, in my version, a primitive humanoid tribe, I mean, the, basically the equivalent of the Aztecs, who worship the sky gods. And so when the Decepticons get there, they go, yeah, we're those sky gods you've been worshiping all this time. So get all this energy stuff and give it to us. And then when the, you know, Autobots get there, it's like, you know, they're selling you down the river here. They're, uh, they're fakes. They're not the real thing. And there becomes in this, in the society, there ends up with this kind of, uh, tension between those who want to believe the sky gods are real and those who are going, uh, this, this sounds awful bogus to me. You know, do we really want to believe this? And it wasn't an attack on faith so much as it was an attack on those who deliberately misuse faith. I think at the time I was pretty ticked off at some televangelists who had been caught in some scandal and, you know, refused to have the decency to step down or, or you know, just basically uh you know brazened it out and um i just i felt i had to make a comment on it and i couldn't make a comment on it of course using humans and earthbound religions but i could sure create an alien race and you know an alien religion and comment on it that way bionic six bionic six was a show that we were doing at tms tokyo movie shinsha TMS is one of the big animation powerhouses in Japan, and they had been trying for years to get a foothold in America for distribution and production. They had a show called Mighty Orbots, and I did three episodes, I believe, of Mighty Orbots. It was a fun show, a lot of fun to do. After that, they, they asked me to stay on, come on staff, and, and just do development for them. And I did about a year's worth of development and then uh, I left full time work at the studio, but I was still contributing scripts. And I forget how many bionic scripts I wrote, but I wrote a handful and uh, worked with them, had a good experience with it. Uh, but it was compared to other things that I had done. It was it was kind of a low key show, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You wrote one brave star. Yes, that was as a favor to Arthur Nadell. Because Arthur was, we had gotten in touch with each other, and he had mentioned, again, they were having problems coming up with stories. And I said, well, you know, the only one I'd be interested in doing is a, a story about, because you got these characters running around with guns, and I had been doing G.I. Joe, and even though it's lasers, you're still, you know, there's a lot of gunplay involved. I said, I want to do something that examines the seriousness of, of owning and using a firearm and how dangerous it is. And it's not a toy. And, of course, Arthur thought that was just a, a great idea. So I wrote The Ballad of Sarah Jane because Sarah Jane was the nickname that one of the characters gave their blaster. And I did this story where some kid gets some alien kid gets their hand on Sarah Jane and, and not knowing not fully appreciating how dangerous a weapon it is. It's just going around playing with it, showing it off. And I liked that episode a lot. I was very happy with that. It is the only episode of Brave Star that I've seen, because as I said, Filmation uses a lot of same-as stock animation. And I recognize if I ever see any other episode, I'm going to be heartbroken because I will recognize how much of mine was just stock animation. So... I'm not going to watch any other Brave Star episodes, but that one, that one I am very happy and very proud of. You wrote two episodes of Jim. Yes. Thoughts on those? Yeah. Again, it was uh, one of those cases where you get caught up on your own show and somebody else is lagging behind and uh, they can use a little help, you know, getting episodes set up. As I recall, both of the episodes that I did were not part of the main story arc that Christie was doing. They fit in insofar as the antagonists and the protagonists were the same characters, but they weren't germane to the overall arc. You could see them or not see them is basically what it boils down to. 
and I think one was One Gem Too Many, and uh, I can't remember the name of the other one. Straight from the Heart, or am I misremembering? Uh, let me get Maybe that. it was Gem Straight Jam. from the Heart. Yeah, the okay. Title. Yeah, well, um, and and that's where I brought Hector back, because I, I, needed a big, I needed a big info dump, and I needed to have one of the characters who was pretending to be Jem act in a very bad manner, and I thought, well, what would be a better way to act in a bad manner than giving... Hector Ramirez a hard time on national television. And so, you know, that's what I wrote in. And that was a fun show to do. It was, uh, we did some, uh, My Little Ponies as well. And, and the My Little, My Little Ponies and the, uh, the gems for the guys that were working on the, uh, the, the harder action stuff, they were like palate cleansers. You know, you, you can only blow up so many tanks and then you go, ah, let's do something a little different, you know? So you go over, you do a little pony, you do a gem and you go, okay. Great. I'm I'm ready now to go back and start blowing up tanks. Do you remember writing for uh, in humanoids? Yes, yes. That's got a, a fun story. In, in, in humanoids and gem are are two examples of how the toy business and the animation business coexisted. At the time, toy companies were financing shows that were based on toys they were doing, and they would create a toy. Uh, with the idea of turning it into a TV show to promote it. And this was through a thing called the barter system. And basically the way the barter system worked was they would take, they would go to individual local stations, uh, not, not to networks, not to cable companies, but they'd go to individual local stations and say, we will give you a half hour of programming free. All we say is half the commercial time belongs to us to promote our product. The other half of the commercial time you can sell to anybody you want. Well, you know, most most local TV stations are operating on a very thin thin margin. If somebody comes in and offers you a free half hour, 65 episodes, you know, and all they're asking is just let us have half the commercials, you go for that. And so that was the golden age of syndicated animation because all these toy toy companies were pushing animated shows well the problem was is that some of the shows the shows could be good but the toys not so good and jim i know there's a lot of people out there who are fans of the show who collected the dolls jim failed to connect with the the young girl audience jim the toy doll failed to connect with the young girl audience the way they hoped. Jem, the TV show, was gangbusters. And in fact, they canceled the toy line towards the end of the first season of Jem, but they recognized they had such a huge hit on their hands. The, the ratings were so high on it. They did a second year of the show, even though they didn't have any product to sell. They just sold other Hasbro stuff instead. And... They kept the show going for a second season, even though the toy itself had been canceled. The same thing happened with Inhumanoids. G.I. Joe's cost $3.25 at that time. And the average kid could either save up their pennies or had a, enough of an allowance. They could go down to the toy store. They could buy a G.I. Joe and bring it home. Inhumanoids, the cheapest ones, I think, cost something like twelve and a half dollars And the big ones were like $20 and up. That's a mom purchase. Your mom has to give you permission to buy that. And they would take one look at this stuff and go, no, we are not having this in the house. This grotesque, horrible stuff, we're not paying $20 for me to have to look at this thing in the house. And so even though the toy line was popular, it didn't sell well because they couldn't, they didn't get to that price break that would have supported it without parental approval. So in humanoids, the toy line, got canceled halfway through production of the series. And we were told, yeah, we're canceling the, the toys. And we said, well, is, does that mean the show is canceled? They said, no, we have a commitment to finish the show. Basically, you guys can do whatever you want as long as we don't get an FCC complaint about it. And we go, really? Okay. you know. And we just went nuts at that point. I mean, like the last six episodes, just crazy off-the-wall stuff. We, we ran a character for president and won. <laughs> so I mean, we uh, we just went crazy for the for the last few episodes. Speaking of toy driven programming, you wrote one Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. Thoughts on that? 
I came in very late on that. It was a freelance gig. They had only a few slots open. If I remember, it was episode 52. For some reason, the number 52 sticks with me in it. And that is about all I can remember of it, to be honest with you. I know it had the full complement of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle characters in it. Uh, I forget who the story editor was, um, but it, you know, I, I turned it in. I got paid. It, it came out in the end looking pretty close to what I had written. So, you know, that was about it. You wrote one Chippendale, one Disney cartoon. Any difficulties writing for Disney? Not really. Um, you know, the, the, the big difficulty with Disney, of course, is always getting paid. Uh, but luckily for me, it, it, uh, it cleared and it came through without too much difficulty. Um, I remember it's got this dog, this heroic dog. And I remember from the original 101 Dalmatians, there's a TV show that the Dalmatians are watching that has this heroic Rin Tin Tin dog character in it. And I simply thought to myself, what happens if that guy, if that dog is not the hero that he plays on television, but he's really a coward? And I pitched that. I'm trying to remember who the story editor was. I'm going to say Marv Wolfman, but I might be 100% wrong. I might be remembering Marv from uh, Disney Comics, because I did do a few Disney Comics stories. But um, whoever the story editor was, I pitched it. They liked it. I wrote it. Um, minimal changes that I recall and uh, got on the air. And then I think that was that was it. I, I never approached Disney again after that. Was it Tad Stones or Bryce Malick? Yes, it, it, I think I think I was dealing with Bryce, but I did talk with Tad at some okay. point. I know that. Yes, it okay. was definitely Bryce. I want to jump back just quickly because it's my favorite. You wrote <laughs> C flat and B, C flat or B sharp for Tiny Toons. I'm, I'm I am ticked off that whoever got the title card wrong. The joke is C sharp or B flat. Ah. Does the script say the corrected one? Yes. And when it when it was actually when I saw it on the air, I was like, "No, you flipping idiots! That's wrong." Actually, to be honest with you, the script doesn't exist. There is no script. This is the weirdest pitch that I ever had, and it's the weirdest story that I ever sold. And I I, I have yet to hear of anybody doing it exactly the same way that I did here. Paul Dini was the, he was the story editor on Tiny Toons. And I went into him one day and said, this is exactly what I said. The Tiny Toons deliver a piano to the tune of the Hungarian Rhapsody. And he said, write that up because he knew instantly that it was going to work. And they, they were working already on a uh, classical music and it, this one would fit in perfectly. So I go home and I start to think, well, how, how do I write this up? Because it's got to match the music. And, and I don't read music. I can't, you know, give them a copy of the score with, you know, notes on it. I mean, uh, written notes on it saying this happens here, this happens there. So this is back in the days when they still had LPs. <clears throat> I bought a, a copy of the Hungarian Rhapsody. I played it. It was a 33 and a third record, but I played it at 45 RPM to speed it up so that it would fit the time allotted. And then I narrated what was happening over the music. And I recorded it a couple of times until I got it, you know, just where I wanted it. But I would do stuff like falling, bookshelves are falling, and now they're running here and running there. And I was just narrating that way of what was going on. And that was given to the animators. And the animators listened to it, and they were going, okay, hey, all right, we understand now what the rhythm is. The music department got a copy of it, and they transcribed it, and they sped up the tempo so that their version was recorded at the tempo that was needed to get all the music in to fit the, the cartoon. So it ended up turning out to be a very successful cartoon. The, the only dialogue in it was just to link it up to what had been what was going on in the other segments. And I think it was Yosemite Sam has uh, a brief line to the effect of where are those guys with the piano or something like that. 
And, and it, that existed just to fit it in with what else was happening in the cartoon. It ended up being shown at the Hollywood Bowl. And they, the, the Hollywood Bowl peri- periodically in the summers will take a movie or something and they will do a live accompaniment of a scene that is based on classical music. And they picked that one to do one summer. They did it. They were doing a whole uh, tribute to classical music and cartoons. And they, they showed my cartoon with them playing the music live to it. And none of the people at Warner Brothers and the common bleeping courtesy to call me up and say, hey, they're running your cartoon. You may want to go see it. Speaking of Warner Brothers, I'm holding the DVD in my hand, and then we'll we'll wrap up shortly. The, okay. the one Batman the Animated Series you wrote, Cat Scratch Fever. Was that your story? No. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember her name. Yeah, Sean tell me her Derrick. name, please. Sean Catherine Derrick. Sean Derrick. Sean Catherine Derrick, right. She was on staff. She had written a couple of episodes and I'm, I can't remember why she couldn't write this one. She either had another one that she had to do or there was some other thing that was happening, but it was a time constraint problem for her. She she did more episodes than than that one out of uh, time necessity. They needed to have somebody take her outline and do it as as a, a script. I had pitched and sold and written the script called Fortune's Hostage, which was when the show started production, the idea was to do half classic villains, half new villains. And I created two brand new villains for uh, the show, uh, characters called the Count and the Contessa, who are a father and daughter Euro trash crime team. In between the time that they gave me the go-ahead to script and I actually delivered it, The suits at Warner Brothers decided, no, we're not going to do any new characters. We're only going to do establishing characters. Harley Quinn barely scraped under the wire, much to everybody's delight, because she was a very good character. That's Paul Dini's creation. They decided they just killed my script. They paid me for it, but they killed it. They said, we're not going to do this one. And as a consolation prize, they gave me they said, you know, um, you know, Sean's not able to do the script. We need somebody to just finish it for us and, you know, get it on its feet. So I, I did that. I wrote the script up. There are a few of my kind of touches in there. I mean, the, the underlings, the bad guys in it, you look at it, you can see they're pretty clearly based on the three stooges. There's some of the dialogue that's obviously, you know, dialogue that I would come up with. Nobody else would, but it was basically her story. I stuck very close to what she wrote. And I was, I was happy with it. And I thought it came out well. I actually wrote two other scripts with Steve Gerber. If not for Batman the Animated Series and whatever series they did right after that one. Uh, but I, I co-wrote the script. The Creeper was introduced. And these were unofficial collaborations because Steve, wonderful writer, incredibly inventive, always had a challenge with deadlines and he was he was best when he was allowed the time to develop and create at his pace and every now and then he would need some help getting over the finish line if you know what i meant and i was one of the guys that he would call you know when he would have like a comic story or um you know animation script and say i just i need someone to just block it out for me and then i'll go in and i'll polish it up and you know, so the introduction of the Creeper and at least one other script I co-wrote with Steve, but uh, Steve just paid me out of his script fee. I didn't get paid directly from Warner Brothers, so Warner Brothers never knew my involvement. Okay. By the way, uh, Jack Mendelshawn is credited as the uh, story editor on TMNT. So, okay, just to put his name out there. What are some of the benefits and negatives of working freelance versus being a staff writer on an animated show? Uh- well, to be very honest with you, if someone approached me today and said, we're doing a new animated show, and if you want, you can pitch for it, I would be very, very reluctant to waste time and energy pitching, because I'm just tired of jumping through hoops for other people. After my run at Sunbow, I was freelancing for a few years. And uh, it was just becoming 
increasingly difficult to satisfy all the various suits and other people with what they wanted, often contradictory objectives. There was some Hanna-Barbera show, and I, for the first time ever in my life, I had an across-the-board writer's block. I have had occasional writer's blocks where a particular story isn't working, and I just go, okay, fine, I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to go over here, and I want to work on another story for a while. This was the first time every bit of the creative process shut down, and it was just my brain saying, no, you are not going to do this. You are not going to keep jumping through hoops on silly shows that are never going to be remembered, that are, that are, are you know, they're not even being watched by anybody who wants to watch them. They're being watched because there's nothing else available. And uh, I just, I just got to the point where I'd, I had had my fill of that. I did not want to be going in every damn month to somebody who never heard of me, didn't have enough background information on me to know this guy can do the work and then be given some, you know, stupid ass show that, um, you know, has a, a, a myriad of problems with it. And yet I'm not allowed to address any of the problems and try to fix them. And so I just went, you know, I'm done. I'm, I've, I, I had a good run. I'll move on to something else. Got a gig, uh, at Penthouse Comics, which, as I described, was a bathospheric excursion into the bowels of hell. That lasted three months. I got out of that. I was basically just picking up odds and end jobs, small work, bits and pieces here and there, you know, video games, the occasional comic book. Thanks to the efforts of Mark Evanier, I ended up being uh, Stan Lee's director of creative affairs, vice president of creative affairs at Stanley Media, which is, <laughs> you know, that's a story. But from there, Stanley Media got me the opportunity to create the Serenity series, which was a series of graphic novels for the Christian tween to teen market. Uh, I described Serenity as being uh, Archie's with an edge, which is pretty much what it was. We were trying to be as realistic as possible and show what the real challenges are in daily living, not, you know, highfalutin spiritual stuff, but how do you deal with a person in your life who really irritates you, but deal with them in a way that is just and fair? And, you know, that was that was the kind of stories that we approached and, and what we would do. So I was very proud of the Serenity series. I hope to bring her back at some point in the future. Since then, I've been focusing much more on books and short stories, and I've got a couple of dozen short stories have been published in the last few years. I've got one coming out in June in a book called uh, Heartaches and Half-Truths. Uh, the name of that story will be called Tongor of the Elephants. It's a crime story set in the uh, era of old movie serials. So if you if you like old movie serials, that'll be uh, an interesting thing to read. Look forward to that, everyone listening. Professionally speaking, what is your proudest achievement? What work are you most proud of? The work professionally, career wise, I am most proud of is the Serenity series that I did because I finally was able, without anybody interfering with me, to tackle real stuff, real problems, real issues, attack them, address them directly, not through any kind of, you know, hinting at and, and express solutions the daily problems that we face that are positive and make the world better as opposed to making it, you know, a, a nastier, snarkier place. In animation, I would say my proudest moment would be the two-parter, The Traitor for G.I. Joe. I'm also very proud of Arise, Serpentor, Arise, which was the miniseries we did that introduced Serpentor. And I, I've come to stop being embarrassed, I'll put it that way by G.I. Joe the movie, because there were a lot of issues during the production of G.I. Joe the movie and in the post-production that bothered me for a long, long time. And then a few years ago, they had a theatrical screening at the Egyptian theater, a double feature with the Transformers movie. And for the first time, I saw it with an audience that was primed to love it. And I realized, you know, for all the things that I wish I could have done better. 
it's still a pretty good movie and it's, it's, it's remembered. So I'm, I've stopped being embarrassed by it. And finally, because these are meant to educate as well as inform, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to be a writer, both animation and both in the comic industry? Well, if you want to be a writer, first off, write. You've got to write. It helps to read a lot, too, so that you understand what other people have, have done and how they've approached material, and that will help broaden your point of view and broaden your insights and help you to, to figure out how to approach things. As far as comics, animation, I honestly don't know what to tell you now. 20 years ago, I could have given some advice that would have, would have made some sense. I, I have no idea what the parameters are at this point. Comics have gotten to be so splintered that if you are not already an established name, you're not going to work, you know, on any of the big characters at Marvel or DC. That being said, there's any number of small companies where you might find a way in. If if we weren't in the middle of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, I'd say to people, go to conventions, meet people at conventions, go to panels, listen to them, talk to them. Um, just, you know, approach people and see if somebody will let you pitch to them. The other approach for comics is uh, if you know an artist, do a web comic, do, uh, you know, a mini comic. Do something together that you can put out there and show people that, you know, hey, this is what we did. Even if you don't make money off of it, even if it isn't something that makes you famous, you at least have something you can point to when you're pitching other things and say, we did this. And people can look at it and go, OK, they, they can at least tell a story. I mean, that's that's how I got the gig at Filmation in the first place. My short stories, I'm sure they weren't that good. The first script I wrote for him, it was awful. I'll be honest with you. But they looked at it and went, well, the guy, the guy knows how to tell a story at least. It may not be a good story. He may need some work on dialogue and a bunch of other stuff, but he can at least get you from point A to point B to point C to point D. And it's clear what's going on. So, Let's give him a shot. We can always we can always fix him if he, he screws up. And I had I had a lot of good advice over the years from people too. I have to say that. Anyone you want to give just names you'd like to name of people who helped you out? Well, I've Quick. I've named several, but uh, anyone you didn't name? Anyone that I haven't named? Um, I mentioned Flint, Steve, uh, Joe, and Ken, uh, Arthur, and Lou. Yeah, there's a lot of people that I've met, and there's a lot of people individually. I'll, I'll throw out uh, Michael Reeves' name, because Michael was involved in the Dungeons & Dragons thing, and he, he was also helpful in getting me on board with that. Yeah, there's a ton of people that I've met and I've worked with and, and talked to, and even people who weren't in the business, who didn't help me directly, but who simply by sharing time with me, talking with me, just the exchange of ideas helped me that way. So there's there's a huge number of people. You know, it's like what Newton said. You know, if I see far, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, it's the same thing here. I I am where I am because a lot of much better people than I, you know, gave me the time to develop as a writer. And I think with that note to end on, thank you for taking the time to speak with me and thank you for writing our childhoods. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.